Good morning again. Good morning. Good morning. That next time I heard Marilyn say it. That Sunday morning, I took the first 11 of the third chapter verses of the book of Acts. And we centered our attention on the message that the angels gave the apostles when Christ ascended into heaven. Where the angels emphasized the obvious that he met a Galilee, why do, you, why do you stand looking up in the heavens? This same Jesus which you see taken into heaven shall come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. The thing I emphasized more than anything else last Sunday morning was the idea that there was an urgency that it was attached to the message of the angels. Why are you sitting here doing nothing except gazing? You have an assignment to do. Go do it. I, I, I read that in the angels' message. They went back to the upper room. And the rest of the, chapter, the first chapter of the book of Acts deals with that time that they spent in the upper room. I didn't know that it was about 10 days that they stayed there, simply because the day of Pentecost was going to come. And they, 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 Jesus appeared alive unto them for 40 days. So there was 10 days left of that 50 days. But if you read the rest of that particular section that, uh, of the first chapter, I'm going to, still going to summarize it, I'm not going to read it. But you find that the first thing that is mentioned is the fact that they gathered there in that upper room. It must have been a pretty big place. For upon the listing of all those people that were there, uh, there was a total number of people there of 120. 120 people. And as you think about this, they were the apostles, save one. Judas, was, Judas Iscariot was not there. There was the women that were there, including the mother of Jesus. And the Bible says his brothers were there as well. Now, you don't, we haven't read much about his brothers in the gospel message. You do find the one place where they came to visit him. We emphasized last week, I believe, that it, uh, when they came, or, uh, they came to be able to warn him about some Lots of were being made against his life. But there was, uh, they're mentioned here, we do know that they had four brothers. Don't ask me to name them because I don't think I can right now. I know the one was James, the other was Jude, uh, I think there was a Simeon. And I can't remember the fourth one. I think maybe Joseph. It's, Peter stood up. And they spent all that time in a lot of prayer. But one of the significant things that they did was what Peter said. He said, it's appointed unto us to replace Judas as an apostle. And he said that the apostle, had, the, the replacement had to be one that was with Christ from the time of his baptism, all through his ministry, even to seeing him after his resurrection. And they chose two of their lot. One was Joseph, who was uh, also known as Bethsabus, and Matthias. They cast lots upon these two, and the lots fell upon Matthias. I got thinking the casting in laws would be very similar to uh, what we uh, uh, would call uh, pulling straws or uh, uh, something on this particular order. But the vote came uh, that Matthias would do it. And the Bible says he was numbered with the 12. Now, I, I want to stress some things that, uh, about this before I move on into the day of Pentecost. I served a church in Michigan where they had an old retired minister. I, I, I got a picture in my mind, but his last name was Miller. 
uh, we became personal friends. And I, I want to emphasize he was a friend, not a antagonist. He even called me back from Tonnesville to be able to perform his wife's funeral. And because of that friendship, I did go back. But he believed, and he had taught in the Sunday school class that he taught, that Matthias was, should not be an apostle. He said it was Paul that was appointed to take his place, and not Matthias. And his argument was that they had not received the Holy Spirit because they came on the day of Pentecost. And the fact that uh, uh, they were acting impetuous, and Peter had that reputation of being impetuous. And he had a whole segment of arguments against Matthias being an apostle of Jesus Christ. I happened to differ with him. And I, I can remember some of the good discussions that he and I would have together uh, over this particular issue. I told him, I said, well, Paul was an apostle, Matthias was an apostle, and if you na name all the apostles that were in the New Testament that were identified by Scripture as being an apostle, you would come up with about 17 different names. And uh, I, he said, well, you made your point. But one of the things that really bothers me, why would the Bible say he was numbered with the twelve if they were acting impetuously and not with the guidance of Jesus Christ in the Holy Spirit? As you know, I have said many times that there were, uh, Jesus on the night that when he rose from the dead breathed on them and says, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. That was the indwelling presence of the Spirit. And the disciples had received that. And the day of Pentecost, when the coming of the Holy Spirit, that was the outpouring of the power of the Holy Spirit, where they received the gifts of speaking in tongues and so forth. And that only happened two times in the book, book of Acts. So I, I do believe that they had the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And for somehow, I think that was one of the things that Jesus had told them to do. While he was still with them during that 40 days. So I'm going to let us have let you make up your own opinion. I'd rather have it accept what the scriptures say that he was numbered with the 12. But notice, if you will, the very first verse of the next chapter. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. The question comes to what was that place? There had to be a gathering place. And most scholars that I have read indicate that that gathering place happened to be the, uh, Solomon's porch, which would have been large enough to be able to accomplish it, accommodate the uh, 120 that were there, plus the numerous people that came as a result of what happened. But the Bible says suddenly there was a sound of a mighty rushing wind. Now remember, that's a sound, not the wind itself. I think we need to be, make that clarification. And that sound of the mighty rushing wind uh, was such that uh, there was uh, tongues of fire, cloven tongues of fire set on the heads of the apostles. That was fire that would not burn. That was, that was fire that would not cast out heat. It was a miracle, I mean, a sign to Peter that this was when the power was to come. And they were to speak all with one accord in tongues. Now this particular tongues was particular for this particular day. There were people of seven, about 17 different nations that were there. And the Bible tells us that each one heard them speak in their own language. I, I, I like that thought. Each one would speak in their own language. They heard them speak in their own language. Let's suppose an angel 
who are to come in our midst right now. We have people from Russia, we have people from China, we have uh, people from Africa, we have people from Mexico in our service. And that angel were to speak, how do you think they would hear? I, I think that these cloven tongues were, were uh, speaking, cloven fires uh, were, were speaking, and causing it to be the words to be translated into the language of the people that were hearing them at the time that they were speaking. What an amazing thing that were happening. And they all began to speak with tongues and uh, people were trying to figure out what was happening. Yeah, Pentecost is the great feast day. There was a great crowd in Jerusalem and the temple would have been full that day. And they began to talk among themselves, well, they're drunk. They're full of wine. And they would have no way of explaining the, the miracle that was taking place ahead of me from God. And Peter stood up and he preached the first gospel sermon. The first sermon of the church this is the beginning of the church, the first sermon of his preaching. And he says, we're not drunk. It's only the sixth hour. And as he spoke to them, he emphasized the fulfillment of the prophecy from Joel. And that particular prophecy had the words in it, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I want you to remember that. Then he went down speaking about the, uh, the death of Christ. He spoke about the resurrection of Christ. And he accused them of killing the, the Son of God in the 36th verse. And when they, people heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and being pricked in their hearts, they cried out to Peter, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And I want you to notice specifically the answer that Peter gave him. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, and ye shall receive the Holy Spirit. Peter later says that the Holy Spirit was given to all those that obeyed him. If this were done in many of church services today, they would be told to call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. They don't include what Peter said here about being repenting and being baptized. Peter has said this earlier, and why he doesn't repeat it now, I think is significant. Because I think the calling on the name of the Lord is not necessarily prayer. It's a part of it. Calling upon the name of the Lord is doing what God, through Jesus Christ, told them to do. What God, through the Holy Spirit, told them to do. Repent, they already expressed their belief. Repent and be baptized. And the Bible says that they were baptized. 6,000 people in addition to the uh, uh, children, that were, uh, women and children that were baptized. 3,000 souls. Boy, I, I would like to see that. One preacher one time told me of a denominational church. He said, well, 3,000 souls received Christ. If there wasn't enough time in the day for them to be baptized. I said, oh, how are you of little faith? I said, there was 120 people. They baptized 120. There were 240 turned around and baptized 240. Then there was 480 that baptized. And I said, it would take very little time for and each one that turned around and baptized somebody else. But I want you to pay, pay particular attention to this last section in the day of Pentecost. Beginning with the 42nd verse, and I'm going to read it. 
And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and the fellowship and the breaking of the bread and in prayers. Those four things. The apostles' doctrine. That needs to be done today in our churches. The fellowship. And if you read the first chapter of 1 John, you'll find that our fellowship is not only with one another, but it is with Jesus Christ, the Father, and God the Father. If breaking of bread happens to be the Lord's Supper and in prayers, I think one of the most powerful influences in the world today is prayer. Is prayer. And the Bible says in the 43rd verse, and fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods and Pardon them unto all men to, as, as every man had need. Boy, the love that was shown. They sold their possessions. They came and laid it at the apostles' feet. We find this happening all through the Jerusalem church. They have it to show it to those at need. <clears throat> we'll talk about that maybe a little bit later. And they contended daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking the bread from house to house, and eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church, such as should be saved. I want you to see one thing about that last verse. It's God who adds to the church. All we do is plant the seed. We water, water it. We cultivate it. But it's God that brings the increase. We need to remember that. As we look at this, as we study it, there's one thing that kept in my mind, and this is what I want to add today. How many times in this section of scripture <clears throat> did we read about the unity of the church before before Pentecost came <clears throat> they were in the upper room and the Bible says in there that they had all things common there was uh, the Bible says that there was one accord in prayer and uh, supplication Accord, they were one with one accord. That doesn't, that doesn't mean a Honda. And they were with one accord. You read in the first verse of the book of uh, the second chapter, <coughs> they were all with one accord when <coughs> the day of full, full, Pentecost fully came. You read on down that there, after they were uh, continued, they continued with one accord. Uh, and they, with a sinless in mind, they had the unity, the unity of, of love. They had the unity of faith. They had the unity of hope. And they expressed that genuinely. Well, I'm going to have to bring it to a close because my voice is going on on me. If we need to realize the church has to be united. United we stand. And one thing is certain, as you hear over television, together we are stronger. Together we are stronger. Let's remember the day of Pentecost. The coming of the Holy Spirit, which eventually left, but we still maintain the indwelling of the presence of the Spirit. And we need to remember that Jesus is Lord, King of Kings, and that He is in control. We're going to be singing the song of invitation. If there's one here that needs to make a decision for Christ, I invite you to come. Shall we stand?